The Georgia investigation is just one of three ongoing probes into Trump's potentially criminal activities during his presidency. It focuses on the former president's efforts to have Georgia officials dispute or alter the results of the state's 2020 presidential vote, which narrowly favored President Joe Biden. The two other investigations, both overseen by federal special counsel Jack Smith, concern the alleged mishandling of classified documents at the end of Trump's presidency and efforts in other states to falsely certify the 2020 election results in his favor. The Georgia investigation is led by Fulton County District Attorney Fani Willis, a Democrat. Her office has been investigating allegations that Trump tried to convince Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and Governor Brian Kemp, both Republicans, to deny that Biden won their state. Trump also told Raffensperger that he was taking a big risk if he did not overturn the state's election results, and that Raffensperger and Ryan Germany, the former general counsel for the Secretary of State, could face unspecified criminal charges if they did not comply with Trump's demands that they substantiate false claims of thousands of ballots being destroyed in Fulton County. According to reporting from The Washington Post, Willis has been seeking information from two businesses, Sympatico Software Systems and Berkeley Research Group which Trump hired to investigate claims of voter fraud in other states. Trump's campaign spent more than $1 million to hire the firms in late 2020 to investigate claims of voter fraud in Georgia, Nevada, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Georgia's RICO laws require only two incidents of racketeering behavior to justify an indictment and define a wide variety of activities, including illegally distilling liquor and prostitution, as racketeering. In the Trump case, it's likely that Trump's and his campaign's false statements to Georgia officials constitute racketeering activity to further the scheme of overturning the 2020 election results. Information from other states can be used because the intended outcome of all the campaign's efforts to overturn the election was to do so in other states and nationally, in addition to Georgia. But just because Willis can point to behavior that breaks Georgia's RICO statute in other places, she won't necessarily file charges in those instances, she may merely use that evidence to build out her office's case that the Trump campaign's behavior amounts to a large-scale, illegal scheme. Trump's legal troubles have come to define his third run for the presidency, but there's no certainty about what they indicate for his future. They may end up playing into his narrative as a political martyr, persecuted by Democrats bent on keeping him out of office, or actually result in accountability for his and his followers' attempts to subvert democracy. In addition to the Georgia probe, the two federal investigations continue. On Friday, CNN reported that federal prosecutors had a 2021 tape of Trump telling his aides and two people working on an autobiography of former chief of staff Mark Meadows that he had retained a classified Pentagon plan to attack Iran. On the recording, Trump indicates that he would like to share the contents of the document but has limited power to declassify documents after leaving the White House. In April, Trump was indicted in a Manhattan district court on 34 counts of falsifying business records related to alleged hush money payments made to Stormy Daniels, 
the actress with whom Trump allegedly had an affair in 2006, during his 2016 campaign. Trump's former attorney and fixer, Michael Cohen, already served time in federal prison for his part in the scheme to keep Daniels from speaking openly about the affair. The charges against Trump relate to the manner in which he reimbursed Cohen for the payments to Daniels, labeling them as legal expenses. Though Trump has been indicted, that case likely will not head to trial till 2024. E. Jean Carroll, the former advice columnist for Elle, also won a victory against Trump last month, eliciting $5 million in damages in her civil suit against the former president. The good news is that, weeks into a counteroffensive, we have some clearer answers to those questions. The bad news is those answers were not great, if you're Ukraine or its backers. Russian fortifications are as formidable as advertised. Western equipment can withstand a lot, but vast minefields are vast minefields, and Kiev and its newly trained forces have largely failed at conducting combined arms operations on a large scale that is coordinating troops and all this different weaponry, like armored vehicles and artillery, to blitz through Russian lines. Kiev has also suffered high casualties in its attempts to do so. Ukraine knows this and has now shifted strategies to a much more attritional approach, trying to degrade Russian forces and logistics as it focuses its operation on three axes of attack. Russian fortifications in Ukraine are some of the most extensive in Europe since World War II, stretching across the front lines, from Kherson in the south all the way to the north. The Russian military spent months in advance of the counteroffensive digging in, building layers and layers of complex anti-tank defenses. The minefields, most of all, have stymied Ukraine. The Ukrainian front line is carpeted with mines, miles deep. They are trip-wired or booby-trapped. Even if Ukraine's Western armored vehicles can withstand the blasts, the layers of anti-tank mines hinder forward movement, leaving them vulnerable. As soon as Ukrainian units become stuck in an area, they are immediately targeted by artillery, drones, and attack helicopters, Borsari said. Russia has had other advantages in artillery and aviation, particularly its use of attack helicopters, which have been able to pick off Ukrainian targets beyond the protection of Ukraine's air defenses. On the whole, Russia has managed to make adjustments and compensate for some of its weaknesses. It has done things like trying to keep its artillery launchers and ammunition dumps farther out of range of Ukrainian fire. It would be really stupid to not grant the Russians the ability to learn from their mistakes and to adapt constantly, and they've done that said Simon Schlegel, senior Ukraine analyst at the International Crisis Group. Still, Russia has not solved all of its logistical and equipment constraints, 
especially when it comes to artillery. Troops are plagued by low morale, and some are poorly trained. Ukraine can still exploit all of these. Ukraine's newly trained troops were also untested and inexperienced in battle when the counteroffensive began. And even with all this Western equipment and training, Ukraine has struggled to conduct combined arms operations, that is, using all of its military systems and platforms together on a large scale. In the early days of the counteroffensive, Ukrainian forces attempted to break through Russian lines with mechanized combined arms formations, but these were largely repulsed by Russia because of its deep defenses. Ukraine suffered heavy casualties as a result. American and European officials said some 20% of Western equipment was destroyed or damaged in battle in the opening weeks of the counteroffensive. Kiev faces additional logistical and supply challenges. It needs advanced weapons, but it also needs tools like demining and engineering equipment. Ukrainian troops have said they need more of these tools, and Russia is reportedly targeting such equipment in strikes. Ukraine is burning through a lot of ammunition, and it is relying on a lot of different munitions from a lot of different countries. These systems work together but imperfectly, artillery may fire, but it might not travel as far or be as accurate. But Ukraine often has no choice but to use what's available, when it's available, even if it complicates offensive operations. These are not necessarily new difficulties for Ukrainian forces, but they're amplified given Ukraine's ambition for this counteroffensive. Ukraine is currently fighting on three axes, two in the south and one in the east, near Bakhmut. The retaking of Staromayorsk represented progress along one very critical axis in the Ukrainian push south, where Kiev seeks to reach the Sea of Azov, with the goal of slicing up Russian-controlled territory. The military balance of power has yet not shifted in this region. But Staromayorsk was a sign at least, that Ukraine could turn things around in this next phase of the counteroffensive. We may reach a point where Ukraine really can start to attack first the first line of defenses, and the strongest one, built by Russia, Borsari said. So far, most of the clashes and most of the attacks have been in an area that is like a grey zone, it's not even the first line of defense by Russia.
To achieve this, Ukraine is pursuing a more creeping advance, seeking to weaken and wear down Russian troops. It is doing this by targeting critical Russian components, like artillery and supply lines and transportation infrastructure. This helps Ukraine preserve manpower and equipment, but it costs a lot more in artillery and in time, without a lot of change in territory. To some extent, I would say that is the trade-off that Ukraine is plagued with, Masur said. Manpower is one of the big questions around Ukraine's capabilities right now. Kiev kept thousands of newly trained troops in reserves, but in recent weeks it has started at least sending some of those into battle. This may signal a more intense push by Ukraine, but it carries risks, too. During this period of time, there was a huge surge of activism taking place to reverse this discrimination and injustice. Activists worked together and used non-violent protest and specific acts of targeted civil disobedience, such as the Montgomery bus boycott and the Greensboro Woolworth sit-ins, in order to bring about change. Much of this organizing and activism took place in the southern part of the United States, however, people from all over the country, of all races and religions, joined activists to proclaim their support and commitment to freedom and equality. For example, on August 28, 1963, 250,000 Americans came to Washington, D.C. for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. They came to have their voices heard and listen to speeches by many civil rights leaders, especially Martin Luther King, Jr., who delivered what would become one of the most influential speeches in history. Today we're going to be talking about categorizing and classifying reading strategies. You can follow along in the box as I go through the bulleted points. Information that has been classified together has been put into categories. You categorize when you put a name to the things you have classified as similar. Naming how objects or information have been classified helps to identify how the parts of the group are alike. Things might be categorized according to their physical structure, called their makeup, or characteristics called features. Readers use categorization to name how items in text go together. Officers use the names of each chapter or section to categorize information. Let's take a look at what classified means. Again, you can follow along the bulleted points when items are grouped together based on details they have in common. Can you describe it the way Miss Flowers taught us? What do you mean, do you remember how she told us to communicate using clarity and precision? Oh, I remember. That means I should be careful about the words I choose so that other people can understand what I'm describing. We're always trying to get our students to use very specific language. We're saying that the more that you think with clarity and precision, the more likely you're going to be able to think better about situations. We don't want you to just be using generalizations. We want you as young children to begin to realize how important it is to be specific. We want to urge children to use clear, precise language and that if we detect vague language, we help them become more specific. I get it. It's way more clear now. I think it's a story in my head and really focused on it so I can tell you all the details. And I saw them perfectly.
And when you say communicate, do they actually communicate like they warn each other about a fire or an invasive species or something? Yes. So, if one tree gets damaged by the mountain pine beetle, the injured seedling will up its defense enzymes and then the receiving tree will then increase its defense enzymes because it knows now that there's some kind of damaging agent around. Wow, so how are they? Are they doing this? How are they communicating through through an underground network? So they're physically connected by these microscopic fungi and so mushrooms. Yes, you're right. We call them hyphae or mycelium. In fact, like if you were to, you know, peel back the surface of the forest floor, you'll see the fungi that are linking these trees together. We can certainly try and pay for these things later on in life. But that's incredibly expensive. It's incredibly draining on public resources, draining on private resources. And there are so many needs in the community. The more we can focus on children and families early in their development, the better off we'll be in terms of our own public resources, public education, and public health. The other thing that I would recommend is we think about linking the two together, right? We have these systems of health. We have these systems of education, but rarely are the two talking to one another. So in particular, in those early years, just before a child is born and then in through those first five years, it's critically important that we invest early on. That way we can make sure that that, that individual is on the right path to start school and to start helping. Economists tell us that for every dollar that we invest in a child's life before they turn six years old, returns over seven dollars of community benefits back to all of us. And so what that means for first time and for our county is that every dollar we're investing our communities can down the road as this child gets older, as they succeed through school, and as they become productive citizens. And so early childhood education, particularly if you look at the research, it pays off in the long run. So it's really important for the business community and for the rest of our community to be focused on those aspects of early childhood education, particularly high quality early education that pay off in the long run. We can pay for it now and invest well into a child's well-being, into kindergarten and then beyond. It's really recommend that everybody take some organization studies courses that even if you're not planning to become a nature specialist. These courses will provide leadership skills that we've got courses such as his Rosen's on leadership development. They're going to give you the interpersonal competences and skills to advance in your career. So I think that's organization studies give people a place to go into a number of different careers, be it in the public sector of the private sector or a non-profit. Think everyone needs to understand how organizations are structured, how they function and how people interact. And then to get to your strategic goal. It's really important to take organization studies courses. And I know it's a bit of a hard sell for a lot of students who are appearing in it.
The primary role for women was still considered to be, quote unquote, at home, regardless if they had a family or not. Now, it's interesting. Even if they didn't have a family, their role was considered to be at home. Women who had the same jobs as men were paid only about 60% of what men made for doing the same work. Now, it's interesting, we could say, well, we've made a lot of progress since then and not a whole lot. We're still, it's still around 75% instead of 60% of what men make. Today, it's even as low as about 75%. So there still isn't at least pay equality for women as compared to men. Women still only made up about 21% of the workforce in. There were not that many options for working women. Folks, today I want to show you why that's wrong. I want to talk about the power of fashion and the ability it has to transform our lives. This day and age is, statistically speaking, the best time ever to be alive. We have longer life lifespans, way lower mortality rates, easier access to food, shelter, education. We should all be so incredibly grateful for the gift of being alive in the 21st century. But there's a catch, right? All those perks of the modern age are pretty much offset by that constant pressure to be productive. But that idea, that sentiment, it's based on something we all intimately know. We all know that the way you dress influences how other people perceive you. It's the reason why your mom's ironing that white shirt before your first proper job interview, or you're up at midnight texting your friends 15 different outfit options before your first date with that smoking hottie from the library. All right, so when you are making an argument, you're going to construct an argument. One of the first things you have to do is you have to know the point that you're trying to make. As a part of making your point, you have to develop a thesis statement. A thesis statement is your claim or the point that you're trying to make. And preferably, it's condensed down to a very clear, concise and accurate statement, which we call a thesis statement, a statement that when someone here is that they know one. That's the promise you're making to your reader. And two, they know exactly the point you're trying to make. And there's no confusion. It's very clear and articulate. Once you've developed your thesis statement, you need to identify the evidence that you're going to use to support your thesis. A flower's color, however, isn't a foolproof guide to a good lunch. That's because the color can change depending on the angle at which sunlight hits its petals. A yellow flower, for example, may look somewhat blue from one angle and red from another. Scientists call this kind of color change iridescence. It's the same phenomenon that makes a rainbow appear in a soap bubble or on a CD, says Beverly Glover. She studies plants at the University of Cambridge in England. In 2009, Glover and her colleagues showed that even when petals look shimmery, bees can still tell which flowers likely hold food. But she and others noticed something odd about iridescence. It's not quite as flashy in plants as in other life forms, Glover says. The backs of jewel beetles or the wings of certain butterflies, for instance, shine and shimmer a lot more.
Scientists around the world are racing to learn how to rapidly diagnose, treat, and stop the spread of a new, deadly disease. SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, was detected for the first time in February 2003 in Hanoi, and since then has infected more than 1,600 people in 15 countries, killing 63. At this point, there are more questions than answers surrounding the disease. Symptoms start with a fever over 100. 4 degrees Fahrenheit, chills, headache or body aches. Within a week, the patient has a dry cough, which might progress to shortness of breath. In 10% to 20% of cases, patients require mechanical ventilation to breathe. About 3.5% die from the disease. 